Today on Earth Focus, bumblebee ecologist Dr. David Goulson on the ecological impact of neonicotinoid pesticides. Coming up on Earth Focus. I've been studying insects for a long time and, and as a kid he collected butterflies and was in, in, into insects generally, fascinated by them. Um, and hence I'm really depressed to see that, that, that insects generally, and in fact wildlife generally, is, is declining. And I'm pretty convinced that one of the drivers of these declines right across the world is, is overuse of highly toxic persistent chemicals like neonicotinoids. If we don't do something about it, if we carry on using them as we are at the moment, they will continue to accumulate and our wildlife will continue to disappear. And in the long run, that's going to do irreparable damage to ecosystems and ultimately to us because we depend on all these things. We depend on bees to pollinate our crops, on worms and other organisms that live in soil to keep the soil healthy and so on. If we wipe them all out, then ultimately we'll wipe ourselves out. Most of the focus in recent years and the impacts of neonicotinoids has been on honeybees, but I think there's really good reason to believe that it's much, much broader than that, that essentially they're impacting on all insects living in farmland and also probably on things that eat insects that rely on them as food, so birds, for example. It's come to light that these compounds are very persistent. They're being applied year on year to almost every arable field in the developed world and their half-life, the time it takes for the chemical to dissipate, is often in the region of three, four hundred days, sometimes up to a thousand days, which means it's more than a year, potentially. As neonicotinoids build up in the soil, they're, they're water-soluble, so they're applied as a seed dressing. But being water-soluble, it means they're free to move around in the soil water, so not only are they accumulating in the soil, but they're also leaching out in the soil water into, into streams. And there's, a, there's been a number of studies actually in, it just come out this year from all over the world, um, but particularly interesting ones actually in North America, where they've found really high concentrations of, of neonics in water, far higher than those needed to kill aquatic insects, which means no food for fish, um, salmon and trout and so on, and birds. So you'd expect whole cascades of effects through ecosystems, which is pretty alarming. Bumblebees are the things that I study. And I should say for completeness that there are many, many other species of bee. In fact, over 20,000 species of bee in the world. And most of them we don't know much about at all, but they're all important, they all pollinate something. Some of them we know are, are really good at pollinating our crops. So for bumblebees, uh, every tomato you've ever eaten was almost certainly pollinated by a bumblebee rather than a honeybee or anything else. Um, lots of other crops, so raspberries, strawberries, blueberries and so on, pollinated by bumblebees. And so we need this diversity of bees, both wild bees and managed bees like honeybees. So my real interest uh, has always been on, on bumblebees, bumblebee conservation and their ecology and understanding more about what they do and how they do it. In recent years, we've turned our attention to looking to, to see what impact neonicotinoids may be having on bumblebees. We wanted to know what would happen to a bumblebee nest that was next to uh, a field of a flowering crop like canola that had been treated as a seed dressing with a neonicotinoid. So we simply took bumblebee nests and we either gave them healthy food for a fortnight or we gave them food that we'd uh, added um, uh, neonicotinoids to to mimic the exact concentrations that would be in the pollen or nectar they gathered from a treated oilseed rape crop. And then we put the nests outside. They then had to forage for themselves. They had to fly out into the landscape and bring back food. We compared how well the nests did that were either treated or not treated. Uh, and the effects were really astonishing. We found that the control nests, the ones eating healthy food, grew faster, got much bigger. Compared to the treated nests, the treated nests produced 85% fewer new queens than the healthy, the, the control nests. If that's happening with wild nests, which there's no reason to believe that it wouldn't be, then that means that the following spring there's going to be 85% fewer queen bees starting new nests. Um, which you'd imagine it could have huge knock-on long-term effects um, if that's happening every year. 
So uh, many people would say we need pesticides to grow the food to feed the, the growing world human population and that it may be a, a sort of necessary evil to, to sacrifice some wildlife along the way. Fine. So you then look to see, you try and weigh up the damage that neonicotinoids seem to be doing against the benefit we get from them in terms of increased crop yield. And amazingly, after using these things for 20 years, the most widely used insecticides in the world, it turns out there's virtually no evidence that they're actually effective. So there have been a whole swathe of studies, particularly from North America, uh, come out in the last year or two, where they've simply grown crops with and without seed dressing and found that they get exactly the same yield without the seed dressing as they do with it. In Italy, for example, they banned neonicotinoids for use on maize several years ago. Uh, farmers grow their maize perfectly well without any neonicotinoids and their yields haven't changed at all. So it seems to me that we can pretty much do without them. I was taught about integrated pest management, which is a, a philosophy of pest management based on minimising pesticide use. Uh, the idea is that you, you try and use biological controls, you use crop rotations, trap crops, there are all sorts of techniques that don't involve chemicals. You monitor your crop for pests, and if, despite all your other efforts, you still have a pest problem, then, and only then, you resort to using your pesticide. It cuts down the cost for the farmer, he doesn't need to use the pesticide very often. It's much better in the long term because the pests themselves are much less likely to become resistant to the pesticide and obviously it's much, much better for the environment. We've known about this for a long, long time, um, but we seem to have forgotten it. We've gone back to using, prophylactically using insecticides as the only means of controlling insect pests. It's absolute madness. I don't understand how we've got to this situation. Um, it seems to me that essentially we've been somehow railroaded by agrochemical companies into relying entirely on their products. And the only people that benefit from that are them. It certainly doesn't benefit the farmer and doesn't benefit the consumer who gets to eat food that's contaminated with lots of pesticides. And it most certainly doesn't benefit the environment. Airwaves, a global channel of uncompromising stories. World news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.